So chapter 16, we talked about speaking to persuade. The persuasive speeches will be based on questions of fact, policy, or value, and how to organize those depending on which one it's based off of. Now we're going to talk in chapter 17 about the methods of persuasion, how to persuade your audience. You will be building credibility, using evidence and reasoning, and appealing to emotions. So we can say that listeners will be persuaded by a speaker for one or more of four reasons. Because they perceive the speaker as having high credibility, because they are won over by the speaker's evidence, because they are convinced by the speaker's reasoning, and because their emotions are touched by the speaker's ideas or language. Which of the two imaginary statements would you most likely to believe? That Lamar Jackson uh, was quoted for saying, our biggest issue is the same issue that the whole world is facing, and that is habitat uh, destruction. And that Steve Irwin, Irwin said, technology is changing professional football in ways that the average fan cannot see. Or switch those around, that Steve Irwin said, our biggest issue is the same issue that the whole world is facing, and that is habitat destruction. And Lamar Jackson said, technology is changing professional footballs in ways that the average fan cannot see. So most likely you would choose the second set of statements. And that is because you're more likely to respect the judgments of conservation from Steve Irwin and respect the judgment of Lamar Jackson when he speaks on the subject of football. This is called the credibility of a person on that topic. So ethos, that's the name used by Aristotle for what modern students of communication refer to as credibility. Credibility is the audience's perception of whether a speaker is qualified to speak on a given topic. Many things will affect a speaker's credibility, including sociability, how dynamic they are, physical attractiveness, and perceived similarity between the speaker and the audience. But above all, credibility is affected by two factors. Competence, that's how an audience regards a speaker's intelligence, expertise, and knowledge of the subject. And character, how an audience regards a speaker's sincerity, trustworthiness, and concern for the well-being of the audience. So you want to keep in mind that credibility is an attitude. It exists not in the speaker, but in the mind of the audience. A speaker might have very high credibility for one audience and very low for another. So it's really going to depend on the audience's attitude towards that speaker. A speaker's credibility can actually change during the course of the speech. And there's three types of credibility or um, stages of credibility. You have the initial credibility, and that's the credibility of the speaker before she or he starts to speak. You have the derived credibility. That's the credibility of the speaker produced by everything she or he says and does during the speech itself. Then you have the terminal credibility. That's the credibility of the speaker at the end of the speech. High initial credibility is a very great advantage for any speaker, but it can be destroyed during the speech, resulting in low terminal credibility. The reverse can also happen. You can have a very low initial credibility, but with a great speech, finish off with a high terminal credibility. In every speech, you will have some degree of, of initial credibility, but that's just going to be strengthened or weakened by your message and how you deliver it to really result whether you're going to have a high or low terminal credibility. So how can you enhance your credibility? First, you can explain your competence. You do this by advertising your expertise on the topic. Did you investigate this topic thoroughly? Then tell them, tell the audience. Or maybe you have experience that gives you special knowledge or insight. If you do, address it, let them know. Secondly, establish or create common ground with your audience. This is a technique in which a speaker connects him or herself with the values, attitudes, or experiences of the audience. You do not want to assault the audience's values and opinions. What you want to do is identify yourself with your audience. 
show them how your point of view is consistent with who they are and what they believe. And establishing common ground is important at the start of a persuasive speech. You wanna show them that you share their values and attitudes and experiences. Get them nodding their heads in agreement. And then they'll be much more willing to whatever your ultimate proposal is at the end, that action you want them to do. So for example, if you're trying to talk about increasing tuition to college students, that's probably not gonna go very well. But if you establish that common ground at first, then it's easier to have these types of topics, have the audience agree with these topics, especially if it affects them um, or it's a controversial topic. So let's look at this following example. Here's a speech about increasing tuition um, to college students. So the speaker starts with, as we all know, there are many differences among the people in this class, but regardless of age, major, background, or goals, we all share one thing in common. We're all concerned about the quality of education at this school, and that quality is clearly in danger. The economic crisis has hit every aspect of life, and education is no exception. Budgets are shrinking, faculty salaries are falling, student services are disappearing, and we are being crowded out of classes we need to take. Whether we like it or not, we have a problem, a problem that affects each of us. There are no easy answers. The one thing that will help solve the problem is an increase in tuition. I don't like it any more than you do, but sometimes we have to do what is necessary to protect the quality of our education. So you'll notice the speaker by stressing common perceptions of the problem, the student hoped to get off on the right foot with the audience. Once that was done, then they're able to move gradually with a more controversial issue. So they included themselves in that saying, I am just part of, you know, I'm just like one of y'all and I don't like this solution as much as y'all don't. However, it is a necessary one. And the third way to enhance credibility is to deliver your speeches fluently, expressively, and with conviction. Speakers who speak moderately fast, use vocal variety, communicate ideas in a lively and animated way are all seen as more intelligent and competent by the audience. That's why it is so important that you practice your, practice your persuasive speech fully ahead of time so that you can deliver it fluently and expressively. Also, you want to deliver your speech with conviction. How can you convince others if you haven't convinced yourself? How do you want others to believe and care about those ideas if you really don't believe and care about them yourself? So really your spirit, your enthusiasm, your conviction, if you truly genuinely care, it's gonna carry over to your listeners naturally. So now let's talk, that's credibility. That's one method of appealing to your audience or persuading your audience. Then there's with evidence and reasoning. This is where you're appealing to the logos. Logos is a name that Aristotle used for the logical appeal of a speaker. So there's those two major elements of logos, evidence and reasoning. Evidence we've discussed uh, plenty of times, it's the supporting materials that you're using to prove or disprove something. So that is examples, statistics, testimony. Most people are skeptical and suspicious when you are making unsupported generalizations. You can't just claim something but not have that evidence to support those claims. So you, as a speaker, they want to hear you justify your claims with evidence. And evidence is especially important when you are targeting an audience who opposes your point of view. So remember, that's your target audience. They are mentally arguing with you in your persuasive speech. They're doing that give and take exchange. So whenever you provide the evidence, you are refuting those objections in that exchange. Tips for using evidence. Use specific evidence. No matter what kind of evidence you employ, statistics, examples, or testimonies, it will be more persuasive if you state it in a very specific way or uh, specific terms rather than just general terms. 
use novel evidence. So it's more likely to be persuasive, especially to a new audience um, or to an audience if the information you're providing them is new to them. So you'll gain very little if you're citing facts and figures that your audience is already very well um, what knows this information and they still disagree with it. So you're really not gonna persuade them. They're like, this is old information. I don't agree with this. But when you provide new information that they're not familiar with, then it really gives them that, gets them to that point where they are questioning or doubting, um, just re-examining their own beliefs. And then use evidence from credible sources. We've talked about this. Listeners will find evidence more competent, credible sources are gonna be a lot more persuasive than evidence from less qualified sources. And make clear the point of your evidence. So use your evidence to prove a point. Normally you want to have that point and use some type of link showing this is my point, this is the evidence, and this is how that evidence proves this point right or if you're trying to prove something wrong. Many new speakers present those statistics or facts or that evidence, but they don't really tie it in to the point that they're supposed to be proving. So that's evidence. Now let's talk about reasoning. Reasoning is the process of drawing a conclusion on the basis of evidence. So you wanna remember that no matter how strong your evidence is, you will not be able to persuade unless the listeners grasp what your reasoning is. So first you wanna make sure your own reasoning is sound. Second, you have to try to get your listeners to agree with your reasoning. And there's four basic methods of reasoning We'll talk about how to use those in your speeches. So you have reasoning from specific instances. That's when reasoning moves from particular facts to a general conclusion. A speaker concludes that unethical banking practices are common in the US. To that, the conclusion, they come from, the, they get that conclusion because they have been several major instances of banks being guilty of fraud in recent years. So this is reasoning from lots of specific instances and they're able to come up with that general conclusion that this is a common thing that's happening. But like anything, there might be some exceptions. So you want to make sure that you are reinforcing your argument with statistics or testimony too. So let's look at an example of uh, exceptions. Let's say you had a PE class in college and it was really easy. Your roommate had a PE class too, and for them was really easy, and your brother had a PE class, and for them was really easy. So from those uh, specific instances, you come up with a general conclusion that all PE classes are easy. Well, unless you actually do research, have statistics, have testimony, you really can't prove that. And most likely, um, this isn't, this is gonna be an exception to that rule. You really can't make that general conclusion because there might be colleges that have different requirements on what the PE class should include. However, when it comes to uh, reasoning from specific instances, you're looking to see, is there an actual pattern? Is it enough to prove this point? Then there is reasoning from principle. And that is where you move from a general principle to a specific conclusion. So it's the opposite of the one that we just discussed. Uh, once again, from general to specific instead of specific to general. So for example, fact one, all people are mortal. Fact two, Socrates is a person. Therefore, conclusion, Socrates is immortal. So you'll see it went from a general, all people are mortal to Socrates is a person to the specific Socrates is mortal conclusion. So you begin with a general statement, then you move to a minor premise, and then you end with your conclusion. A good persuasive speech uh, to show uh, as an example of this is Susan B. Anthony's speech, is it a crime for a US citizen to vote? So her general statement is, and it's a fact, the US Constitution Constitution guarantees all US citizens the right to vote. Then she moves to the minor premise. Women are US citizens, right? So therefore she concludes, US Constitution guarantees women the right to vote. 
For this method, you still want evidence to support your general principle and your minor premise. Um, if not, the audience might not accept it without evidence. Then you have causal reasoning. And that is reasoning that seeks to establish the relationship between causes and effects. So an example, if there's a patch of ice on the sidewalk, you fall and break your arm, you reason that because the patch of ice was there, you fall and broke your arm. So sometimes you, uh, an example of this would be, you want to know what causes chronic fatigue syndrome or what caused the football team's latest defeat. You might also want to know the effects, speculate about the consequences of chronic fatigue syndrome or as a star quarterback's leg injury. So it's trying to establish a relationship between the cause and effects. But like all the other reasoning, you want to be careful because it's not always clear and some events might look like they're cause and effect, but they actually will be co uh, coincidence. So let's say a black cat crossed your path, then five minutes later you trip and break your arm you wouldn't blame the black cat for your accident. It was just a coincidence that the black cat happened to pass by. So just as well, don't assume events um, only have one cause. Sometimes they might have several causes. So you do have to be careful with this type of reasoning. Then you have analogical reasoning. And that is when a speaker compares two similar cases and infers that what is true for one case must be true for the second. For example, if you're good at tennis, then you most likely will be good at ping pong. And the logical reason is used in persuasive speeches that deal with questions of policy. We covered that in chapter 16. So when you're arguing a new policy, you should find out whether it has already been tried somewhere else. You may be able to claim that your policy will work because it has worked under similar circumstances. If you are arguing against change in policy, you should also check whether the proposed policy or something like it has already been implemented elsewhere and did it work or did it fail. So those are different reasonings. Let's talk about fallacies. Fallacy is an error in reasoning. As a speaker, you want to avoid these errors or these fallacies. And as a listener, you have to be alert, be able to pick these um, out, these fallacies in the speeches that you hear. So here are some common fallacies. You have the hasty generalization, and that's a fallacy in which a speaker jumps to a general conclusion on the basis of insufficient evidence. So for example, somebody could say, college dropouts always make excellent business leaders. Just look at the examples, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, and Steve Jobs. They all dropped out and went on to create powerful companies. Well, these three do not prove as much or aren't as much evidence to actually make that generalization that all college dropouts will be successful. They are exceptions. So a more accurate statement to avoid this hasty generalization would be some college dropouts have gone on to make excellent business leaders. This statement would be more factually correct. Then you have the false cause. And this is a fallacy in which the speaker mistakenly assumes that because one event follows another, the first event is the cause of the second. Remember that the closeness in time of two events might be entirely coincidental. For example, when a team from the NFC wins the Super Bowl, economic growth during the next year is stronger than when a team from the AFC wins the Super Bowl. Therefore, if we want economic growth, we should root for a team from the NFC to win this year's Super Bowl. There might be a slight correlation between economic growth and which conference wins the Super Bowl, but there is no causal connection between the two events. Whether the American economy rises or falls is not dependent on the outcome of the Super Bowl. Another fallacy is an in invalid analogy. An analogy in which two cases are being compared, but they aren't actually alike or um, sufficiently alike to compare them. So here, let's look at this example. In Great Britain, the general election campaign for prime minister lasts about a month. Surely we can do the same with the US presidential election. At first glance, this analogy might sound, seem sound, but the British and American political systems are not alike enough to warrant this conclusion. The US is much larger than Great Britain and the party system operates much more differently. 
So you want to be careful and not be comparing two cases that really shouldn't be compared that are apples and oranges type of thing. Then you have the bad bandwagon fallacy. And that assumes that because something is popular, therefore it must be good, correct, or desirable. Let's look at the example. The governor must be correct in his approach to social policy. After all, the polls show that 60% of the people support him. Well, this statement is fallacious because popular opinion cannot be taken as proof that an idea is right or wrong. Remember, everyone used to believe that the world was flat and that space flight was impossible, but that does not mean that they were right. Then you have the red herring fallacy, and that introduces an irrelevant issue to divert attention from the subject under discussion. So let's look at this example. How dare my opponents accuse me of political corruption at a time when we are working to improve the quality of life for all people in the United States? Well, in this case, what does the speaker's concern with the quality of life in the US have to do with whether he or she is guilty of political correct corruption? Absolutely nothing. It's a red herring that they are stating to divert the attention away from what the real issue is. So you wanna be careful with the red herring fallacy. Uh, more as a listener, you want to hear out if they're using something kind of like bait. Look at this over here, don't pay attention to this. Then you have the ad hominem fallacy and that attacks the person rather than dealing with the real issue in the dispute. The head of the Commerce Commission has a number of interesting economic proposals, but let's not forget that she comes from a wealthy family. Well, here they are attacking the commissioner's family background rather than dealing with the substance of her economic proposals. You might be familiar with this type of, of fallacy in presidential or just any political debate. Then you have the either or, false dilemma. It's a, fa a fallacy that forces listeners to choose between two alternatives when there are actually more alternatives than two that exist. So this statement oversimplifies a complex issue by reducing it to a simple either or choice. Is it true that the only choices are to raise taxes or to eliminate services for the poor? Well, a careful listener might ask, what about cutting the administrative cost of government or eliminating pork barrel projects instead? So with these same think as a speaker, you want to avoid them and as a listener, you want to have an ear out for them where they are just giving two options, but really there's alternative options. Then you have the slippery slope fallacy, which assumes that taking a first step will lead to subsequent steps that cannot be prevented. Here's an example. Now that everyone is texting, posting on social media and sending video messages, it is only a matter of time before people forget how to write complete sentences and the whole English language falls apart. Well, obviously this is overly dramatic um, and it's not gonna be where one step's gonna lead to the English language falling apart. Because yes, even though texting and social media are a very big part of our lives, um, we still have that professional uh, aspect to our lives, you know, working career, we have our educational aspect to our lives, where we are required to have a higher standard of, you know, using English. So if the speaker claims that taking that first step will lead to ine inevitably a series of disastrous later steps, then he or she needs to provide evidence or reasoning to support that claim. Then we have appeal tra to tradition. It's a fallacy which assumes that something old is automatically better than something new. I don't see any reason to abolish the Electoral College. It has been around since the ratification of the US Constitution in 1789, and we should keep it as long as the United States continues to exist. Well, there are good arguments on both sides of the debate over abolishing the Electoral College. However, to conclude that the Electoral College should be kept forever solely because it has been part of the US Constitution is an appeal to tradition fallacy. Just because a practice, an institution, or an idea is old does not automatically make it better or good. Its value should actually be based on the contributions to society, not on its age. 
So if a tradition were the sole measure of value, then we would still have slavery. Women wouldn't be able to vote and people would undergo surgery without anesthesia. So always keep an ear out to appeal to tradition fallacy. And then we have the opposite, appeal to novelty, a fallacy that assumes that something new is automatically better than something old. Our church should adopt the updated new international version of the Bible because it is 400 years newer than the King James Version. The fact that the new international version of the Bible is newer than the King James Version does not automatically make it better. There might be reasons why a church might prefer the new international version, but the speaker should explain those reasons rather than assuming that one version is better simply because it is new. So those are the fallacies with reasoning. So you wanna watch out with those. Now let's talk about appealing to emotion. So we talked about appealing to credibility, appealing to with evidence and logic and reasoning. And now we're gonna talk about appealing to emotions, that's pathos. So pathos is a name that Aristotle uses for what we refer as emotional appeal. By adding that feeling and that force of imagination to your logical statements, then you can become even more compelling persuasive speaker. So it's not only about the logic, but sometimes when the speech lends itself to it, that topic, you also wanna make it stronger by appealing to the emotions. So what are emotional appeals? They're intended to make the listener feel sad, angry, guilty, afraid, happy, proud, sympathetic, reverent. These are all appropriate reactions for speeches that are based on the question of value or policy. Usually the speeches that are based on the question of fact, it is just facts. It's kind of hard to really bring emotion to that. But when it's value or policy, remember these kind of combine. So it's more about those attitudes, those beliefs, so what people feel is right or wrong for them. So we'll look at a, a list of emotions with examples of subjects that might stir up that emotion. Fear uh, would be the emotion. So subjects would be um, fear of serious illness or natural disasters, sexual assault, personal rejection, economic hardship, hardship. compassion for war refugees, for battered women, neglected animals, starving children, or for victims of cancer. Pride in one's country, one's family, one's school, one's ethnic heritage, or one's personal accomplishments anger at terrorists and their supporters, business leaders who act unethically, members of Congress who abuse the public's trust, landlords who exploit student tenants, and vandals and thieves. Guilt about not helping uh, people who are less fortunate than ourselves, about not considering the rights of others, and about not doing one's own best and reverence for an admired person, for traditions and institutions, and for one's deity. So use emotional language. You want to use emotion-laden words to generate emotional appeal. Let's look at this statement. The promise of America sparkles in the eyes of every child. Their dreams are the glittering dreams of America. When those dreams are dashed, when innocent hopes are betrayed, so are the dreams and hopes of the entire nation. It is our duty. To me, it is a sacred duty to give all children the chance to learn and grow, to share equally in the American dream of freedom, justice, and opportunity. So you notice in this statement, all the underlying words and phrases have strong emotional power. So when you're trying to persuade Think about what type of words you can use to stir those feelings. Secondly, you want to develop vivid examples, letting the emotional appeal grow naturally out of the content of your speech. Then you also want to develop those vivid examples. So most effective way to do this is use vivid, richly textured examples that pull listeners into your speech. Here's an example of a story and you're using those words to generate the emotional appeal. Nathan was only five years old when the fever struck him. 
At first, no one knew what was wrong. No one knew that parasites inside his body had infected his red blood cells. No one knew those cells were clumping together, choking the flow of blood through his body and damaging his vital organs. No one knew his kidneys would soon fail and seizures would begin. No one knew he would wind up in a coma. The parasites in Nathan's body came from a mosquito bite, a bite that gave him malaria. And Nathan is not alone. The World Health Organization tells us the horrible truth. In Africa, a child dies from Malaysia, malaria every 30 seconds. So you'll see how this is giving a story, a narrative, an example of one person. However, it's doing it to give that um, face and name to everybody else who is a victim of this. And number three, speak with sincerity and conviction. All of your emotional or emotion-laden words and examples will be empty trappings unless you feel the emotion yourself. And if you do, your emotion will then communicate itself to the audience through everything you say and do. So not only the words, but also through your tone, your voice, the rate of your speech, your gestures, and your facial expressions. Remember though, ethics and emotional appeal. When trying to move the listeners to action, you should never substitute emotional appeals for evidence and reasoning. Evidence and reasoning is your first go-to. When you have that strong evidence and supporting evidence and the topic lends itself to emotional appeal, then you want to add that. But emotional appeals can come second to evidence and reasoning. So you should always build your persuasive speech on a firm foundation of facts and logic. Build a good case based on reason and kindle the emotions of the audience. So here's a diagram to show you the methods of persuasion. You have ethos, which is a credibility, logos, which is logic and reasoning, and pathos, emotion. So for ethos, once again, it appeals to ethics, credibility, trust. Example would be professional endorsements, doctors, scientists. Um, let's say a commercial of toothpaste that says, you know, every three out of four dentists are recommend this brand. Then you have logos that appeals to the logic, the reasoning. So you're using numbers, statistics, graphs, and charts. Um, think of a commercial of phone service company, and it's showing that coverage of the map. You know, it's a graph showing just how much coverage they have and why you want um, this company versus others. And then you have pathos that we just covered, and that appeals to emotion. So you're making the listener feel something. Think of commercials of, you know, Sarah McLaughlin playing in the black in the background. Um, you know, every, you know, one for $20 a month, you could be saving these abused animals and they have, you know, the poor doggies in cages. So it's, it's appealing to your emotions. So I hope this chapter lecture um, really helped y'all to see what those different methods of persuasion are and how you will connect this with chapter 16, which is your speeches, depending on if it's based on facts, values, policy, knowing that, how to organize it, and then what's the best method to use credibility, um, logic, and emotions, depending on that topic.